The road to fiscal sanity in Canada, that is the topic of tonight's byline. In the United States, things are so bad that they're headed for another showdown on the issue of debt, deficits, and spending just about a month after they had the last one. Now, Obama says he won't negotiate with those uncompromising Republicans, and they better do exactly what he says. Now, we're not in the bad situation. We're not in the same situation as the United States. Far from it. As the Harper government repeatedly tells us, we're in the best shape of the G7 nations. For now. And that's the part that they don't want to talk about. Not in public, anyway. I've had private conversations with people in the highest ranks of this government, and they know that we're on the same road as the U.S. and Europe, even if our little car is going a lot slower than the others, they know that we need to fix things. So it's a mystery to me why we continue to spend, spend, spend. Last night I showed you where your federal tax dollars go and recommended a few things that we could do, such as cutting status of women, such as stop cl collecting money for the provinces. And I asked you for your ideas as well. B.D. Neely wrote in saying that we should abolish Indian affairs. Lynn said we should stop funding Planned Parenthood. Richard said cut the CBC by $1.1 billion and, well, while you're at it, cut another 20,000 federal jobs. In Tono, <clears throat> Tono said we should actually just cut foreign aid. A foreign aid is a favorite target of people that want less government spending. Now, there can be an argument made for foreign aid in many situations. Sometimes it's humanitarian aid to respond to a crisis or... We use aid to bolster a fragile government and keep the terrorists from getting control, but many times it makes no sense whatsoever. For years, CETA, the Canadian International Development Agency, sprinkled money all over the planet. Now, since the Paul Martin government, there have been attempts to focus in on countries that we can have a real impact on rather than spread, uh, spreading our money too thin. That's a good idea, a noble goal, but we still spend money in ways that make no sense at all. More than a year ago, on this program and online, I revealed how we were subsidizing our competition. In November 2011, we were giving aid to 9 out of the 20 G20 nations. The G20! We were subsidizing the G20. These are countries with the world's largest economies. And since the recession took hold in 2008, well, they've been the group tasked with shepherding the world economy back onto a solid footing. Yet, there we were, giving more than $140 million in aid to G20 countries. Didn't make sense then, doesn't make sense now. By my rough calculations, we're giving less to G20 countries than we were 14 months ago, but we're apparently giving, still giving, $123 million. Now, that doesn't include the myriad of other funds that are not as easily traceable as CETA's core funding. From giving just shy of three quarters of a million dollars to Turkey or about $200,000 to Russia, Canada still funds nine out of the 20 members of the G20. Argentina got 2.3 million, Brazil 12.2, China 29.9 million dollars to the Chicoms, India 22.6 million, Indonesia 34 million, Mexico, Mexico got 7 million, and South Africa 14 million dollars. I want to point this out, folks. These are not desperate, destitute, third world countries. These are members of the G20. What on earth is CETA thinking? I've asked questions about China for years, and I've been told, well, you know, well, we got to fund some things. Well, what are we funding in China? China, the world's second largest economy. China, a major exporter of all kinds of goods to Canada. What are we doing there? According to CETA, we're promoting human rights. According to CETA, we're promoting justice. But thankfully, the majority of programs we fund there will be coming to an end by 2014 and China won't be eligible for funding. But let's talk about Indonesia. It's a growing modern country in Asia that's attracted an investment from around the world. So why do they need, why do they need our money? This is the presidential palace you're looking at. That's what they have for the presidential palace. Maybe we give them money, though, so they can buy new jets for the president. They just bought some beautiful Boeing jets that cost more than our annual aid to them. Unlike China, we won't be cutting Indonesia off anytime soon since they're listed as one of the five countries of focus in Asia, along with Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. Look, I'm not against all foreign aid, but at what point should you cut somebody off? Apparently, we don't cut countries off. Otherwise, we wouldn't be funding any G20 nations. The late C.D. Howe, the ex-liberal cabinet minister, the minister of everything in the Kane and St. Laurent governments, reportedly once said, a million here, a million there, and soon you're talking real money. And that's true. 
People don't want spending cut on their pet projects. And they'll say, well, it's only a few million dollars. But if you add up all the millions, a few million here, a few million there, you're talking real money. If we're going to return to fiscal sanity, we have to stop dismissing certain budget cuts as too small. Maybe we should say, take care of the millions and the billions will take care of themselves. And that's the byline. What we need to do in this country is make sure that we're doing all we can to ensure that our economy will continue to create growth, uh, well-paying jobs and prosperity over the medium and long term for the next generations. That was Prime Minister Harper in an interview he did with me back in September, September 12, 2012 actually. Um, it's funny because he was tipping his hand there at something that would come out later. The government is not focused on balancing the budget. They're worried about moving too soon and doing too many cuts to balance the budget. They're worried about hurting the economy and I think they're worried that the public's not on side. Dr. David Coletto, our in-house pollster, the man behind Abacus Data, joins us now to say that's not exactly the case. Uh, David, you've been looking at these numbers for a while and you did a poll ahead of last year's budget. Right. The public has an appetite for cutting. They are, uh, they do. We, we asked, you know, how much of a priority should the federal government make balancing the budget? And a large majority of Canadians <coughs> said it should be a high priority. 65% said it should either be a very high or high priority. And, and what's interesting, it's not just conservatives in this poll. Well, not when you've got 65%. Not at all. It, it's actually pretty equal if you look at New Democrats, if you look at Liberals, at least 60% of voters in, for those parties think we should be balancing the budget. So I think there is a consensus. I think we've had a consensus in Canada for quite some time, um, pretty much I think since, since the Kretchen was able to balance the budget in, in the 90s, that, that balanced budgets are good things. These are things that governments should be doing. And um, I, I don't think the public's changed that, op uh, their, that opinion, even though we've had uh, the economic downturn. It's interesting you bring up the Kretchen era because the when I talk to conservatives, they say, well, Kretchen had the reform party on the right calling for the budget to be balanced. We don't have that. We've got parties on the left calling for more spending. But across party lines, you're saying people want the budget balanced. Do they care if it means people losing their jobs or cuts? Well, we asked about, in that same survey, we asked specifically about public servants. And there was talk here in Ottawa that, that the government was going to cut a significant number of them, which they ended up doing maybe not as much as, as some people wanted, we saw that there was wide support for, for job cuts in the public service. People, and, and I think this speaks to, to the challenge that the government faces when trying to deal with the public on, on spending cuts. And, and it's, it's why I think they can't do maybe what they want to do all the time. Public looks at, at things like healthcare and education and say, don't touch that, don't touch that. But they do see maybe areas like foreign aid, like you mentioned in, in your opening, or, or the public service cuts as areas where there can be savings because in another survey I saw, a majority of Canadians believe, 56%, said that they think federal politicians, bureaucrats, waste their tax dollars. So it, it's a challenge that way, but I think there is, there's a, an appetite for a balanced budget and then there's an appetite and acceptance that something's got to give and they are willing to see some cuts to, to jobs. So it... it they're worried about a cut to service, but they want cuts to federal public servants. That that is a, a bit of a a bit of a quandary for the politician going forward because uh, jobs mean services, but jobs also mean a lot of money. It came out recently, one hundred and fourteen thousand dollars, I think it was, is what the average civil servant costs taxpayers when you add in benefits and so on. So that adds up to quite a bit. It does, and, and, and sort of this, I, we, we tried to understand why, right? Why is the public, who are largely not public servants, um, accepting of this? Um, and it, it's because, unfortunately for public servants, there's this, this perception that they don't work as hard, that they're overpaid. And so on, on top of it, while if you're, if you're an average Canadian thinking about this thing and you think that about a public servant, then you're going to be accepting, um, you know, their cut to their job. And so I, I think that... If you're, if you're the government of Canada and you're trying to figure out how to do it, and I think they are challenged by public opinion on this question, um, they can, there are ways to do it. The public will accept it. They see the importance of it, but they just have to do it in a balanced way. And I think the government maybe is trying to do that. I don't but know how successful. They, they haven't found the formula yet or they haven't found the conies. We'll find out. David Coletto, good talking to you again. Thanks, Brian. All right, so if you need more reasons 
on why we need to cut, you need to think about this as you give the email. Let's put up that uh, on the screen again, The uh, our current budget debt, Canada's federal debt. There are 603 billion reasons that we need to find savings. What are yours? Email me, byline at sunmedia.ca, byline at sunmedia.ca.